Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of The Inner Typewriter, the show with typewriters, coffee, and conversations about how to make our writing better. I'm Scott Calhoun and with me today is September Williams. Welcome to the show. Thank you. September is, uh, you're an MD writer, you're a filmmaker, and a bioethicist. Uh, you have so many facets and it's amazing that you're still just one person. So tell us a little bit about how you, how you grew into all these roles. Um, it does help that I think that it's all one thing, that these things are just related. They're just different manifestations. But um, so Diane Frake, who did uh, the Yoga of the Impossible, forced me to write a short bio about myself for one of her classes that I did a reading. And, and basically, she forced me to go all the way back. So I first published when I was eight years old. Wow, and eight? I was eight years old. It was the school newspaper at the elementary school in Venice, California that was gerrymandered to, um, to even though Venice was a triracial ghetto then, it was gerrymandered to Beverly Hills and it had an excellent elementary school. So I danced, I did yoga, and I learned to write. And my first article was on the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. So I've always been a writer. And I was a writer all the way through high school and, and in college. I actually wrote technical papers living in Canada. So then it was, what is it that you're going to write about? Uh, I think a film is an extension of writing in the master's program that I was in in film. I really was there because I, um, I was writing things and I was visualizing them. And even when I wrote poetry, I was visualizing them. Mm -hmm. But the part that is most significant is that while I was learning medicine and practicing medicine, I was in such intimate contact with the human experience and with um, issues that were problematic to me and to the people I was caring for that it just sort of made me want to look at narrative and how narrative tells stories um, that people can understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and how to give, people were getting more information from the screen um, than they were from any doctor in any clinic or any hospital. So I wanted to know how that worked and, um, and how to try and get um, more appropriate information. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there used to be um, a t-shirt from the Writers Guild that said, on the front of it, it said, seen any good movies lately? <laughs> Somebody wrote that. <laughs> so that's sort of the thing that kept me continually involved in writing. Wow, great. Um, and today's episode is about bioethics. Uh, and maybe our viewers have heard of ethics before, but bioethics maybe not. And you're a bioethicist, so let's figure out from you, know, you, the expert, what is bioethics and how does it come into play in your work? So uh, basically people know what ethics is, they think, but it, it arises from morality. So from the time a kid in their developmental stage hits between six and seven, they are um, usually able to tell right from wrong. Just, you know, they know hitting people is wrong and they know, you know, what, so, so that's morality. But ethics is how you actualize morality. Bioethics is how you actualize morality in relation to problems or conflicts that are um, involving the biosphere. So bioethics is both a field of practice, a offshoot of philosophy and ethics and philosophy in the same way law is an offshoot of ethics and philosophy. Mm. Um, and it deals with anything in the biosphere from global warming to whether or not we're going to replace fish, uh, physicians with um, with artificial intelligence Robot doctors. with artificial intelligence and where, where those things are. A lot of people think that bioethical conflicts are, um, are the big things, like putting people in gas chambers. Mm. Bioethical conflicts are very subtle. 
okay? And the bioethical conflict in the Nuremberg doctor's trial, as with the Tuskegee syphilis study, was the first thing is, is that research has to have a hypothesis. There has to be a question, okay? And there were no questions to be mm -hmm. asked. Mm -hmm. And the, so the seawater studies, and uh, you know about those? I don't. The seawater studies. So among the Nazi experiments, and this is a classic one that was used during the Nuremberg trials, among those experiments was to feed people only seawater. That is a major violation of bioethics because there is no need for the experiment. Mm -hmm. Now, like we think, oh, that's horrible, and how could they, but you have to break down what is the problem there in terms of science? We know what happens when people only drink seawater. You know how? A couple of centuries of ship's logs. Mm. <laughs> that people, like very quickly, you can get that information. Near and most time people records. Are, near time records. The ship logs are like, this is what happens, is that you get desiccated, you need to have fresh water, mm -hmm. and the same, it's sort of like saying, let's not give people vitamin C when they're, like we know people get scurvy, scurvy. if they don't yeah. get citrus. Mm -hmm. and so, so people think of bioethics as being really big things, right. or they think of ethics as usually something but it can be quite one. small. Wow. Um, so uh, clinical medical ethics is a part of bioethics, and I trained at the University of Chicago in clinical medical ethics as a fellowship in the subspecialty of medicine. Wonderful. So More than you ever wanted to know. Well, <laughs> that's the thing is, uh, I think our viewers are learning about this issue. And the, the next question that sort of naturally comes is, uh, is bioethics something that should be on writers' minds who are just writing fiction and writing a story? And how do they uh, be aware of the, the bioethics in their own story. There is a way that narrative actually influences people. We know that. That's the Bible, the Talmud, the Quran, right? These right. stories, mm -hmm. right? Really influence people about moral questions. Anytime that something ends up on a screen, someone has either filmed it and chosen what they're going to show, if it's a documentary, or they have written it, and it's doing that. So absolutely, people who are writers, you never know where that work's going to end up. So you can do a few things. One of the things early in the TV show ER that we were looking at was getting certain lines into narratives. So back in the 90s, you would say, do not resuscitate. Um, and we worked hard to get the single line in, do not attempt to resuscitate. Because that says a whole, people assume, well, you should get resuscitated because you're gonna live, mm. right? Resuscitate but that's not what not happens. Automatic. That's not, that's not what usually happens. There are circumstances that improve that, like if you, somebody is there within less than a minute, if you were on a monitor when it happened. But when you resuscitate people who have been down for a long time, you don't get them back. And if they're elderly and they have multiple diseases, so people would have expectations about medical technology mm. that was unrealistic, but the language that we used gave expectations that mm -hmm. were unrealistic. So how we use language is important. You can do a lot of good by putting one or two lines into, right. into things. Um, so when I write, um, I, so the recent book that I've written that you know about is about mercury poisoning. Mm -hmm. It's a romance suspense about mercury poisoning. So the real key is most people are, are look at me and they say, what is mercury poisoning? What is Minamata disease? What is, like, what are you talking about? Right? Well, that's really interesting because mercury is everywhere. It's in cement. It used to be used to put, you know, it's where your white paper napkins come from and why we have so many brown ones now, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, so people get information from stories. Some people take it in very didactically and other people take it in by knowing the story and then looking further. Mm -hmm. So writers can 
by having knowledge of some bioethical issues, they can participate. And it's not just the medical TV shows. Mm -hmm. It's very subtle things. Mm -hmm. I review films and they are by and large not medical films. But you're looking at it from a bioethical lens standpoint. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a film that I reviewed that was seven minutes long. Mm. Uh, just, uh, it's by Marshall uh, Curry, uh, and it's called, it's called Evening at the Garden, and the garden is the Madison Square Garden. And it's a film uh, that was built completely as a documentary from found footage, a couple of hundred hours of it. And it's a story of a night in 1939 where 20,000 Nazis were at a rally in Madison Square Garden. And what he's done is he's looked at what was happening outside, what was happening with the police, what was happening inside, and the people that were at the rally. And it's all silent newsreel footage that he got out of different archives because people don't know about it. And people believe that, oh, well, we would never do anything like that, right? We were mm. on our way into war um, at that point in time. That is a bioethical film. The reactions of the people, it's seven minutes long. And if you look at the images of young kids enjoying the, literally the kicking and, pa and pantsing of someone who dared to stand up and say, this is not my country, right? Who was just a worker who thought since it was billed as celebrating America, <laughs> Yeah. That, that he was going to go because that, that seemed like a good thing. And then he felt, oh my God. And he was just a, really, he was just a worker that went there. Like he was like, okay, I'm going to do this on that evening. Mm. So that's a bioethical issue because it is using propaganda to um, direct people to do things that are violent, that mm -hmm. require society to respond to that violence, mm. um, is, it's, a, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Most of it's more subtle, competing goods. Like, do you want to live forever? Or do you, you want to live, do you want to die comfortably? Mm -hmm. Those are kind of competing goods. So right. how do you resolve those, right? Mm -hmm. Is by talking about how people perceive those right. things. And so, as, assuming what somebody else wants. Right. Then there's the clinical stuff. Uh, the straightforward clinical stuff is things like, I, you know, um, just before Thanksgiving, I got an urgent call from uh, folks on the show Empire. And I was in the Safeway, and I needed to get to a quiet place to talk to them. So I went into the freezer cabinets between the two of them because people go and they get their ice cream and then they, you know, they get out of there because it's always <laughs> cold. So cold. Right? Especially at Safeway, it's really cold. I don't know, there's a special thing they do there. But so I was there and the question was a question about, um, took a while to sort out, but their question was about a directed donation. So of an organ. So can a person designate who they want an organ to go to mm. as opposed to going into the normal system? And yes, they can. Okay. This was a unique and dramatic case because it was fictional and it was about a, a young man who had killed himself and wanted his organ to go to um, his uncle who needed a liver transplant. And the young man's mother, his next of kin, did not want it to go to the uncle. Mm. And so they said, well, could that ever happen? I said, yes, there can be directed transplant. And so, so what would you do? And I said, well, what I would do is I would sort of explore as a bioethicist whose interests are being served, right? Because it's gonna, the mother certainly has rights, right? Yeah. But more importantly, in the structure of transplant, request. Um, we usually an organ transplant uh, team goes and asks for the organ. And they continually say to family members that they do not have to make the donation because it's a level of coercion. But mm -hmm. doctors don't ask for organs. They say, somebody is going to come and talk to you. The reason for that is that doctors have an enormous level of coercion just by being there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have to worry. You're a good doctor. 
right. you will, you will, <laughs> you take, will care take care of me. of me. You will do the right thing. So, so it's handed to someone else to do, but there's this duplicity that says, you don't have to do it. We really want you to, but you don't have to do it because there's this tension between competing goods. So why doesn't she want to do it? And where there's real conflict and you can't do better, you say to the administration in the hospital as a bioethicist that we can keep exploring this, but there's a time frame going on, take it to a judge, mm. okay? Because it's beyond what we can sort out in an appropriate time frame yeah. to make the organ viable. So you take it out of that arena, but if you don't even explore it, you don't even know that there's a problem. So mm -hmm. it's like the mom doesn't want the organ going there, so we won't do it. Well, why right. doesn't she want to? What was the dynamic between her brother, mm -hmm. right, who's going to get the organ or not, mm -hmm. whose interest is being served by that action? Wow. Uh, is she a proxy for her son, or is she mm -hmm. acting only in her own interest? So things like that. It's wonderful. Um, so people learn from stories. They think about things from stories. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful to have you highlighting bioethics for us because it's something that I hadn't thought of before as a writer, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers will be interested to look at their story from this perspective and be more aware. So thank you so you much can for- look up stuff and yeah. say, oh wow, what's happening in that sphere? Yes. Mercury poisoning. You exactly, know? and um, September Williams uh, again is our guest and she uh, is a MD writer, filmmaker, bioethicist, and she also writes fiction. This is her novel, Chasing Mercury, which uh, uses her bioethics perspective in mercury poisoning as an integral part of the plot. Yeah. Uh, and it's something we should all be thinking about So as, as we're embarking on this writing adventure. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Witness to our conversation today is a, a royal typewriter. It's from the 1940s, and uh, as you can see, this one has the uh, the RO is kind of worn off. I'm not really sure how that happened. Maybe they were pressing the number six a lot, um, it, almost like in your Toyota that just says Yoda. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of liked that. Um, but as you can see, this is a standard. It's not a portable. This is not going to fit in a case. Um, but it uh, speaking of you know, the Marshall Curry film, this is just a couple years after that happened. So uh, history comes with us and yeah. uh, it's there if you look for it and, and bioethics is too. Um, so thanks again. Thank you. And um, thank you for watching. And as always, happy typing and remember to follow, share and subscribe.